So uh, everyone, so I'm glad to introduce Peter Anderson. So Peter Anderson is a PhD candidate in computer science at uh, the Australian National University, supervised by Dr. Stephen Court, and a researcher within the Australian Center for Robotic Vision. His PhD focuses on deep learning for visual understanding in natural language. Recently, his team won first place in the 2017 Visual Question Answering Challenge at CVPR. And during his PhD, he has visited numerous universities and research labs, including Adelaide University, uh, McQueen, uni uh, McQueen University, Queensland University of Technology, and Microsoft Research. He holds two un undergraduate degrees, both with university medal, and uh, first starts his career in finance before he switched to computer science. So I'll give stage to Peter, and let's listen to his today's talk, Visual Understanding in Natural Language. Thanks very much, Jadong. Uh, I'm very excited to be here, so uh, thank you for, for hosting me. Um, so um, the sort of common theme with all of this work that I'll talk about is vision and language, and uh, some of it was actually done here, which uh, makes it even more exciting to present to this group. So there's uh, sort of four parts to what I'm going to talk through. Uh, the first is uh, questions about how we evaluate um, generated language from some of these models and so we'll be focusing on the image captioning example. Uh, the second part of the work is about modeling visual attention for the tasks of image captioning but also visual question answering. Um, thirdly, uh, I'd like to look at how we caption images in the wild and sort of you know, capture that long tail of visual concepts that uh, are, are very difficult. And the fourth part um, moves on to sort of slightly different problems and, and looks at embodiment of um, vision and language agents. And um, so in this work, we are actually uh, focusing on navigation and um, proposing a new environment, which I, I think is quite exciting. So let's, uh, let's get started. So I imagine these tasks are very familiar um, to many, but we should just introduce them. So the first task that uh, I'll be speaking about is image captioning. And so the input to a model is uh, a single image, such as these examples. And what we'd like is uh, to build systems that can generate a natural description of what's actually in that image automatically. Uh, and something that would approximate the sort of description that a human might give. The visual question answering task um, arose partly in response to the difficulty of evaluating uh, these captions. And in this task, the input is uh, a, an image, but also a question, um, such as what color is the fire hydrant for this example? And so the outputs then uh, tend to be much shorter and, and more focused and, and therefore easier to evaluate. And so this is a very interesting task as well in the sense that it, it sort of captures some of what, I guess, uh, people's idea of uh, uh, an AI uh, you know, should be able to do. Um, so. Um, and, and obviously in both cases, humans can do these sort of tasks virtually flawlessly. So, so looking first at uh, captions, there's a problem here in terms of evaluating the generated output. And ideally we'd like to be able to uh, train models on these data sets and then um, have a way of evaluating the quality that's fast to compute, that's accurate, and it's inexpensive. And human evaluations sort of fail in a couple of ways. One, they're expensive, but two, they're not very repeatable. So, um, you know, evaluation done here with a group of uh, Turkers, say, will be different to the evaluation done somewhere else. And this isn't just a problem for image captioning. This is a problem more generally for, uh, you know, any language generating model. Um, and even with things like explainable AI, uh, you know, we're going to now let's say, generate explanations and justifications in, in language, and you know, there's just more and more evaluation problems. So specifically for the uh, captioning task, it's actually purely an NLP task in that you're given some candidate caption C uh, and a set uh, S of reference captions written by humans, and the task is to somehow come up with the similarity between the candidate and the reference captions. So there's much existing work here, a lot of it from uh, the machine translation community or the um, text summarization community. Um, 
this one is uh, specific to image captioning that was developed by Georgia Tech. Uh, the common theme here is that these approaches are all based on n-grams and so uh, we tokenize the language and then we're, we look uh, for um, subsequences of words which are common to both the candidates and the reference captions and uh, the sort of you know variations on how that's done. So how well did this work for captioning? This is the uh, ranked scores of the 2015 image captioning challenge which uh, I'm sure you recall that Microsoft was uh, equally first place but the problem is that if we rank them all by, say, CIDIS score, um, what we find is that humans are way down the list, even though we know that the human captions are actually much better. And some fairly simple methods like uh, a nearest neighbor approach with, with a few bells and whistles, but it could actually get much higher up the rankings than human. So, you know, there's something really wrong here. Um, the existing metrics weren't solving the problem. And it's easy to see why that might be the case. So uh, these are just some examples taken from the Microsoft Coco data set of when Ngram uh, can um, fail. So there's the sort of false positive similarity on the left where we have uh, a five gram standing on top of a um, something. And that's common, for example, to both of these captions describing different images. And although there, there is some similarity there, in general, the the visual concepts and the captions of quite different meanings. Similarly, there's this sort of false negative where you can find captions that describe the same image. Uh, they have a lot of similarity, but not a single word in common. And so that's, that's obviously very difficult to capture with n-grams. So let me try to um, lead you on uh, some intuition about how we could do this differently. So. Would anyone like to volunteer an assessment of whether this uh, caption is, is good or not? Yeah? It's not, it's not a basketball court, right. Uh, that, that's exactly what I was hoping you would say, so thank you. Um, and, and here is one way of kind of looking at this. So as humans, we look at this caption we kind of parse it in terms of um, propositions that can be true or false in terms of what this caption is saying and then we test those against the image to look for support. So um, this caption is, is basically saying there's a girl here, uh, the girl is young, the girl is standing and these are all sort of testable semantic propositions and the one that we sort of immediately pick up as being incorrect is that this is a court used for basketball. And so what we would like to do is to somehow uh, look at these comparisons in terms of the sort of underlying meaning expressed as semantic propositions. And uh, this is, um, you know, obviously can be done in lots of different ways and this isn't the only set of propositions you might look at, but, um, you know, intuitively this idea I think makes a degree of sense. So in terms of how we approach this, uh, we basically um, had a, a couple of steps. So we, we take a caption like, uh, let's say, the more correct one, a young girl standing on top of a tennis court. And the basic approach is that we use a, an off-the-shelf dependency parser, the um, Stanford model, to, um, depend, to come up with a dependency parser of that string. Uh, from there, we uh, again built on some prior work using a rule-based system to extract semantic tuples which are represented in a scene graph. And so uh, the scene graph is a, is a fairly sort of loosely defined structure that nevertheless is very helpful for this type of problem. And what it encodes is, uh, in this case, objects uh, in the pink nodes. Each object can have attributes associated with it, such as uh, the girl is young and the girl is standing. And we encode relations in the blue nodes uh, between objects. And with this scene graph, you can sort of pull out the tuples on this side and the basic idea that we're going to use is to then try to match uh, the tuples between the candidate and the reference captions. And so there's some uh, prior work in terms of the scene graphs, um, particularly from um, Stanford, using them for image retrieval. Uh, but obviously this is a sort of fairly general type of data structure that's popped up over and over again. 
Uh, so we propose the SPICE metric, which is uh, semantic propositional image caption evaluation. And um, effectively, it's a, an F1 score. And what we do is we say, um, using the approach on the previous slide, there's some mapping T, which will take you from a candidate caption or a set of captions and then give you a set of uh, tuples representing the propositions. When we map from uh, a set, we're doing uh, merging of synonymous nodes and we use soft similarity with word net synonyms. Um, and when we actually calculate um, the intersection, we also use soft similarity, which is what this operator here represents. So we try to capture synonyms in a similar way that uh, the medial metric does as well. And so um, in, in terms of, you know, I guess where the, the errors can, can creep in, uh, you know, parsing to scene graphs is uh, certainly not a solved problem. Uh, and then, you know, soft similarity here between these concepts is certainly not yet a solved problem. Uh, but nevertheless, what I'll show you is um, that this approach actually works very well uh, in replicating human judgment. So here's a sort of a full example. I, I hope it uh, is possible to read it, but um, at the far left, there's five captions that are the references. Uh, two women are sitting at a white table, etc. We take all of those captions and encode them in this scene graph. So uh, for example, all the, the nodes relating to the women have merged. Uh, and then here we compare a candidate caption two women sitting in a cafe uh, against the scene graph over here and in green bold you can kind of see the objects and, and attributes and things that match. So numerical uh, concepts are also represented as attributes and here although the cafe thing is, is sort of notionally correct, there's actually no support for that in the reference captions and so that isn't matched. Um, so in this case there's no soft similarity between say cafe and store. Uh, whether there should be is, you know, still an open question, I guess. So, how can we evaluate this? Uh, so we basically, with the support of the COCO Consortium, uh, rescored the 2015 challenge. Uh, so this was just done one time. So uh, we, you know, put the metric together. They ran this once and we looked at the correlation at a system level between each of the 15 um, models that were submitted as well as uh, humans who were also um, submitted to the test server. And um, so there's sort of five different dimensions. Basically the most important are M1 and M2 which are um, basically the kind of high level of uh, which what percentage of captions are better or equal to human and then what percentage were indistinguishable from human. And on that basis, the SPICE metric uh, has a, a Pearson row correlation of about 88 or 89 percent, uh, which is much, much higher than um, the previous methods, which are around the 50s at best. Uh, and it's also quite interesting that the Ngram-based approaches actually penalize more detailed captions, um, which uh, you know, doesn't seem to be a, a good characteristic, but uh, that's not the case with, with our approach. So in terms of what that looks like, this uh, just plots the scores on the y-axis for four of the different metrics versus uh, human judgment on the x-axis. And um, at a high level, so with SPICE up in the top left corner, we're uh, selecting the, the same top five um, model-based captions. And importantly, we um, are scoring human captions well above any of the models, which is um, something that the other metrics are not able to achieve. So the, the sort of, um, well actually, I'll, sorry, I have one more slide before we we'll sort of try to tie this together. So um, one nice thing about this scene graph approach is you can dig a little bit deeper into uh, understanding what the error modes might be that's more difficult perhaps with n-grams. So here we, we took all the attributes out of the scene graph and uh, basically we, we sort of looked at all the models um, versus human at the far left. And so you can start to see some things that are happening here. Um, so for example, with number-based attributes, um, uh, you know, humans at the far left are just far in advance of any of these models, uh, which we can basically um, compute from that that, you know, these models don't know how to count objects in these scenes. And 
you know, that's um, I think still the case. Whereas things like color, for example, uh, actually the Microsoft and Google models were slightly better than human at associating colors to the, um, to the objects in, in descriptions, which uh, you know, I think is a much easier task than, than actually identifying separate objects and counting them. So this work was published in 2016. It's nice to see even a year later, um, we're still uh, with this metric ranking human captions better than any of the submitted models, um, at least based on um, C40, which is a, a subset of the data set with 40 reference captions. So if you have enough reference captions, we can still uh, identify uh, humans as being the best. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, you know, this was nice to see that we could sort of better capture human judgments, but probably more generally than that, um, this idea of, of trying to um, assess generated language in terms of the semantic propositions uh, is obviously a, a useful idea. The, the difficult part, of course, is trying to extract those propositions. Uh, in terms of SPICE, at least, as we develop better semantic parsers, we should be able to also upgrade the metric and, and hopefully do better. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions, too, along the way if they pop up. Sure. Yes, um, so um, yeah, it's on the leaderboard. It's uh, in the sort of main uh, evaluation repo and um, most people are now reporting it. So that's uh, nice that we were able to have it be used. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I haven't tried it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I've had inquiries from, um, for example, the video uh, QA group and, and other people have been testing it on um, more visually grounded problems. Um, I'm not sure how well it would work for pure machine translation because the scope of language is much broader. Um, uh, would it work for longer texts? Like um, paragraphs? Um, yeah, so I think uh, it doesn't, um, we haven't sort of explicitly done like pronoun resolution and stuff like that. So I think there'd be some additional problems. Uh, that's right. I, th I think there'd be a couple of uh, issues like that, but um, that's not to say with, with a bit more attention it could be adapted, yeah. Um. Okay, so what I would like to move on to now is a little bit more about the modeling side and uh, specifically visual attention, which, you know, attention in general is very important in these sorts of models. Um, and, you know, not only perf performance, but it, uh, in terms of offering interpretation. So one thing, uh, I guess, is the human visual system and the visual attention system has been quite extensively studied for, you know, at least since the 1960s in sort of neuroscience and psychology literature. And the short conclusion is it's very complicated. <laughs> 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 So, uh, you know, one way of, of assessing it is uh, what are the things that you can focus on all right, in terms of the, the basis of attention or the attention candidates? And in the human system, this could be features such as color or shape. Uh, it can be objects that are the basis of attention and it can be sort of spatially based as you, you know, track objects. Uh, and then there's, there's bottom up and top down components. So I'm walking through the grass and I see a snake. Um, I see that in a bottom-up sort of way. I wasn't looking for that, but it's very salient, and so I notice it. Whereas the top-down approach is where you're sort of actively searching for something and it's task-driven. Um, and so all of these things, I think, you know, are ideas that uh, I guess are interesting to, to think how they fit in the context of our models. The way that's been approached uh, in image captioning and, and now visual question answering, since this sort of seminal paper um, show, attend, and tell is basically um, that you have a, a CNN that you run over the image. It has some top level of activations, which is a, a tensor with two spatial dimensions and a, a feature size. And from there, you, you come up with some weightings, uh, most commonly a soft weighting on each of those regions. And there's been a lot of 
uh, development in terms of how you should come up with those weights, but very little um, differences in what the basis of attention is, like what are the things you can look at. It's always just been this feature map. So we basically, and, and by the way, this is work done here at Microsoft uh, with Zhao Dong and, and Lei and others um, on an internship. But uh, basically we uh, look at this in terms of changing the basis of attention so that rather than just looking at features, we can look at objects. And we introduce a bottom-up component that identifies these objects and sort of process, processes them as a unit uh, in, the, in the model. So how does that look? So typically on the left-hand side, uh, if you imagine at the top level of the CNN, um, you know, each uh, feature there in the map is sort of looking at an equally sized um, rectangular um, area of an activation grid. And so this isn't sort of strictly accurate because the, um, you know, the sort of uh, focus of each of these neurons is, is sort of larger and, and apparently approximately Gaussian, but it captures a general idea that we're sort of dividing our um, space up into these equally sized parts in a grid. So our approach is to basically instead identify all the salient objects and other image regions such as roads and text, et cetera, that's in the object. And then these now become the kind of basis of what we can look at. And uh, in doing so, we, we sort of capture all the attributes that are uh, associated with an object and we process it together, uh, which is a natural thing to do. Uh, and, and as I'll show, it also increases the performance quite a lot. So in terms of how we do this, um, there's been uh, lots and lots of work on object detection, detection uh, such as faster RCNN. So our basic approach is to use faster RCNN as a, uh, a bottom-up attention model to identify salient image regions. Uh, so it's sort of like a, a hard attention model. So compared to a, a traditional approach where you take the top output of uh, um, a CNN, and then each of these sort of vertical features here becomes uh, a feature in a set uh, of K features that you can look at. So here we're going to use faster RCNN. There's a region proposal network that identifies uh, where those salient regions are. From there, there's more processing and a pooling operation over each region. And so again, we come out with an output that, that basically looks the same. It's a set of image features, except here they're from these salient regions rather than just being plucked out of the grid. Um, in terms of pre-training this, so we pre-trained it on Visual Genome, which is a, uh, a large data set of scene graphs. And uh, we basically focused on um, sort of cleaning up the data to about 1,600 objects and about 400 attributes, which we also introduced. So the output of the pre-trained model looks like these examples. Um, so here, for example, uh, oven is the object and open is an attribute that's predicted. Um, and um, so from this, we actually um, discard the predicted labels, but from each region, we just take the feature, which um, includes all of that information. And that's what we're now feeding into the uh, subsequent part of the model. Um, so yeah, it's fast rising in based on ResNet 101. Um, and actually, as Jadong and, and Lei would probably tell you, we uh, initially were experimenting with uh, predicting relations and things here as well. Um, so that's still in the category of future work as we, uh, we sort of haven't got value out of that yet. So do you use the same recovery? Sorry. Do you use the same recovery for uh, fast RT and, and the, the caption language model? No. So, um, Basically, uh, yeah, so faster RCNN has this vocabulary of 2,000 concepts. We actually discard the labels and then just feed the feature so that the captioning model then has its own vocabulary, which is yeah, separate. Um, that's not to say that you couldn't uh, use this as well. So uh, there was some work at CVPR on sort of, um, in fact, there's several where you, you have you know, LSDMs that can copy from the input to the output, for example. So you could use those types of approaches and just directly copy some of this vocabulary through. Um, yeah, so that's something we haven't investigated. Does this mean that the number of objects you're looking at is limited to that? Um, 
not necessarily uh, in because we're not sort of as I said we're not using the vocab what matters is uh, do we focus on the region that's relevant so if you moved far enough into a different domain where the object detection method was no longer picking up salient regions then then you'd have a problem yeah um, and actually so sort of another uh, I guess future work that I'm uh, interested in is uh, how would you train this in a sort of self-supervised way? So there's been lots of work on uh, self-supervised training, some image feature, but what if we also want to train for the image regions uh, since, as we'll show in this work, you know, that turns out to be important. Uh, could you describe early on a uh, kind of baseline that had uniform green? Yeah. Um, so yeah, the percent of these were kids, they would probably look differentially at the, they would not look randomly. Yeah. So do you mean in terms of um, uh, like weighting the different regions yeah, or in proposing the regions in, in weighting? Them. Weighting. Yeah. So in the... Um, That's sort of what you're doing, right? You're identifying salient regions. Yeah. So um, let me just go to the next slide and... and um, try to just complete the picture and then we'll, we'll come back. So um, what I've done in the previous slide is, is I identify where these image features come from and each one has a region. This is just a, a high level of the two models that um, are downstream. So this one is for visual question answering. So it takes as an input um, the question, the image features and then here this is a sort of, um, this is the typical attention component that predicts a scalar weighting for each one of those features, okay? And so the, the captioning model basically does the same thing, given some high-level context, which is the part of the caption that you've already written. You then predict um, weightings to go and look at the image again and produce another word. And so those weightings in the traditional model are applied to, those, um, to that grid that we, we looked at. And so that's how the traditional model has, um, you know, focus on, on different areas. Um, so that part remains the same, but the difference is the, the basis of attention is now these um, boxes. Does, does that um, relate to the question or not really? Or, or we can take off on. I think I'm actually talking about whether you can come up with weights that don't involve a sort of semantic parser that you would have used for labels. So right. Sort of a lower level of analysis, so maybe generating an image feature is interesting. Okay. Well, we'll... Yeah. Right, okay. Um, so, uh, I mean, just thinking of levels of abstraction and visual processing. Right? Yeah. And they're not uniform across the region. Yeah. So, I think it's more at the image feature input than the client. We can talk about um, that. Yes, yeah, so, well, no, I think it actually that's very um, interesting because, you know, some of the work um, I'll get to later where we've uh, got agents moving in environments and the visual stuff is very different to this. And so, um, it would be nice to be able to learn, uh, you know, these regions in a self-supervised way. Um, so, yeah, I've got a few ideas of, of how to do that, but none that are really developed yet. I mean, the real world is going to be based on where there's movement, for example, yeah. right? And in a static image, it's, it's pretty impoverished stimulus. Yeah, so, yeah, if, you, if you're moving the camera, then you can start to disambiguate what things are actually, uh, you know, part of the same object and what aren't. Um, so another way that I was thinking even in static images is by training a model to do in-painting um, and um, basically objects that are disconnected or separate should be more difficult to in-paint when they're separated from the scene uh, and so that might help to steer these boxes around uh, objects that can be separated. So yeah, I think there's lots of ideas we can pursue. Uh, okay, so let's just have a look at some sort of qualitative differences in uh, how the attention works. So this is for the image captioning scenario. Uh, so the ResNet baseline is the same model uh, capacity with a 10 by 10 grid. And um, this is a kind of challenging example because it's not very common in the COCO data set to find a couch in, in effectively a bathroom. And so um, 
the baseline model makes this mistake where it assumes the man's sitting on a toilet and um, you know the language prize are sort of quite strong I guess in that regard um, but the well exactly yeah uh, so the question is why why this model can't uh, look at the scene and sort of figure that out and if you think of the context as it's uh, generating up to this point this context here is sort of used as a uh, a key uh, to basically search the scene and so if it now uh, searches the scene based on the man sitting uh, it sort of looks um, somewhat in the right region but uh, one of the problems is that these regions are just sort of too small to capture the context of the couch uh, and so obviously we can do that here so we can sort of search for the man um, sitting but we pull back a big region that includes all the information processed together about the couch uh, so there's this sort of unwinnable trade-off between like small, feature, you know, finely detailed regions and large regions that we don't have to face when we uh, would do it this way. Uh, so you can kind of see similar things in a visual question answering model. Um, here the, the red uh, box is the sort of highest weighted region which is really just around the helmet which is, you know, very fine detail and similarly here with the shoes. Uh, so you can move from sort of large to fine details depending of course on the quality of the uh, pre-training um, and so you know that comes back to this discussion and is pretty crucial and one thing we haven't done yet is to actually optimize this whole model end to end which is another direction uh, for future work so at this stage the the sort of bottom up model is pre-trained and fixed uh, but what we ought to be able to do is not just fine tune the features but also fine tune the spatial locations. So some results, uh, so these are uh, just comparing to the baseline. Um, so this is a single model on VQA. In terms of overall accuracy, um, the improvement's about 4% or in relative sense about 6%. Um, on the uh, captioning model, so there's, you know, there's a lot of different ways of training, I guess now, traditionally cross entropy loss, but um, now it's much more common to use sort of policy gradients to optimize some metric. But regardless of the approach, uh, comparing on cider and spice scores, which are the, the most representative evaluations, the improvements are on the order of kind of six or eight percent, which is which is actually pretty significant because people have optimized these things for a long time now. So, and using this approach, uh, we you know the so Microsoft Australian Centre of Robotic Vision Joint Entry uh, won the VQA challenge, and we also uh, got to the top of all the metrics on the leaderboard. So. Um, it's nice that, you know, it's sort of interpretable, but it, it also works. Uh, so, in terms of the conclusions from this, um, I think we can argue that this is a sort of more natural approach, um, and the interpretability gains are good. Um, it, it's nice that we're sort of taking work from object detection, which should certainly help our vision and language models and uh, show that we can actually make use of it. So in future work there's uh, a few obvious immediate directions and then probably some longer ones but um, certainly optimizing the whole model, trying to understand why we couldn't get value out of relations yet. Um, there's, there's several explanations I guess which we need to disentangle uh, and then um, yeah, perhaps more self-supervised learning either from camera motion or from other cues. Any other comments or questions before we Carry on. Sure. So when you're, uh, it's an awful lot for me, I'm sorry, sir, but when sure. you're predicting like the captions before, you're actually, that's what you're doing, you're trying to predict the captions, correct? That's right, yeah. Were you trying to use like um, some dictionary database in effect where you, I guess, using a shift AF score or something like that to try to predict what were the words that belong to the object I'm identifying? Um, like the girl on the, uh, on the tennis court. Yep. Like it identified the racket, right? Um, now, with some of the other texts, would you be able to actually sort of then identify, okay, maybe I'm actually standing on a tennis court as opposed to, I was mistaken with the basketball court. That was the beginning. I'm sorry. No, no, that's, but, but the question uh, is valid, I think. So the, um, when all of this model is, is trained, the associations between um, the visually grounded words and the image is all actually learned from the model without direct supervision. So that's part of what the attention model can do with enough data is to actually learn those associations. 
Um, so um, I think that's part of what the question was getting at, or? Yeah, I guess I'm kind of getting, I mean, it's more of a laughing one sort of question. Sure, yeah, well, it's, uh, yeah, I guess it's, uh, I've gone kind of deep in, in the weeds and, and haven't necessarily explained these models in much detail. So uh, we can always um, come back if, if there's interest. Yeah. Right, um, so they're, they're both happening uh, at each, um, like the whole time, I guess. So the, uh, in, the, in the case of captioning, the bottom-up process happens once and then you produce these regions, each with a feature. Then as you generate the caption, the top-down approach happens at each step uh, so that you change the weightings as you go through. So that's sort of what you're seeing here. So, so this is changing the top-down part but keeping the bottom-up fixed. Uh, so, that, yeah, they both operate together. So the, the bottom-up is hard in that it produces the regions and the top-down is soft in that it weights all of the regions that are there. Okay. So what I'd like to move on to now is uh, this sort of challenge of captioning images in the wild. So is image captioning in the wild a solved problem? Uh, so notwithstanding that there's captioning models in uh, you know, Microsoft Office that um, work very well, I'm still going to claim this isn't a solved problem. Uh, and one of the ways I can claim that is to say, well, I believe it's still the case that the captioning model won't always answer if it's not confident. So uh, in that case, there's part of an unsolved problem. Um, looking at just academic data sets, though, the, the problems are much larger. So, if you train on uh, Microsoft Cocoa and then go and try to caption something that's completely different. So I, I should be up front here that this Microsoft Cocoa data set has no sea creatures. So it doesn't, it's got a lot of pizza but no crabs. Uh, and so we get you know, these types of captions that are, are clearly ridiculous. And um, so the real question is like, how do we get this to work on general web images without just having to have enormous data sets that cover every single visual concept in a you know, long tail that's just enormous. So there's some uh, prior work here and one of the ways of approaching it is to say that um, maybe we don't have full captions as training data but we might have some tags, um, some relevant words, um, perhaps an object detection. And s this is the prior work from uh, CVPR 2016 and so the basic approach is you've got two types of training data. You've got uh, images with tags. And so, oops. All right. Cool. So on the left is uh, images with tags, sort of training data. So here you're just basically training a classification model. On this side is uh, images. Um, well, you, you also have sort of images and captions training data. And so in the, in the prior work, they sort of train these two parts of the model separately. This is a language model trained on the caption data. They combine those two um, parts and then do some fine tuning on the image caption data to then try to sort of incorporate the knowledge from the words that it knew how to predict, but it didn't have a full sentence for. Um, and so this is sort of typical of a couple of works in this area. So what, what we did is, is completely different and that makes it sort of interesting to make the comparison. So we proposed a model where the image tags are available at test time, not during training. And um, that opens it up to a sort of wider set of uh, uh, options, I guess. So suppose the image tag is actually ground truth annotation, like in the case of ImageNet, if you actually knew a label but you wanted to generate a whole caption from that. Or suppose that you have uh, task-specific object detectors that you want to sort of swap in and out at runtime for you know, different types of challenges. How far can we get with this type of approach? And so the approach is done in the de decoding of the model. So in the traditional model, you take some input, you have a, a CNN uh, feeding a recurrent network. You then do uh, typically beam search to try to find a high probability output and you get your uh, caption about the pizza. So in our approach, we're using uh, this additional information at test time. Suppose we know that this is something about a rock crab. 
Now we're going to do a constrained decoding. So we're going to basically force the model to mention this uh, string rock crab, but we're going to leave it up to the uh, RNN to figure out how to ground it, what the rest of the information is, and what the syntax is, uh, which, which it's very good at. And in that case, you can get something like this, which can actually then sort of rearrange the entire caption around that information that you had with high confidence. And this is a general approach. This isn't anything specific about captioning. This is a general approach to putting constraints on an RNN. So let me um, try to explain how it works. So um, the first thing is to say that whatever constraints you want to encode, uh, you need to encode them in a finite state machine. So that's a fairly, you know, pretty wide variety of constraints, uh, you know, things you can say uh, encode in a regular expression, for example, or most of them. Um, not everything, but a pretty wide variety. So, for example, suppose we had some information that the image has a chair and a desk uh, visible. We might want to say that uh, let's allow different lemmas. So let's say you can mention chair or chairs. You know, there could be more. We'll leave it up to the captioning model. Uh, let's add some synonyms so that you can mention desk or table. Uh, leave it up to the captioning model. So this is a finite state machine that can recognize if the sequence satisfies the constraint. So we start uh, here at state zero and we look at uh, each uh, word in the sequence. If we see chair or chairs, we're doing a transition this way. If we see desk or table, we transition down and we just process the string. If we're in this accepting state at the end, then the, the constraint was satisfied. Okay, so um, it's, it's easy to you know, encode these sort of constraints in a finite state machine. The trick is how are we going to enforce this uh, in the output of an RNN? So um, first of all, uh, so the, the key idea is we combine the finite state machine with beam search. In beam search, we basically, uh, at each step of decoding, we consider some expansion set uh, of possible uh, next word expansions, and then we just keep the best. We keep the B uh, best, where B is the beam size. So the expansion set, and I'll just define this notation for you now. So uh, we've got some partial caption uh, y up to t minus one. We consider all possible expansions with another word w provided that the partial caption is part of our existing beam and the words in the vocabulary. Okay, so here, um, if you've got a beam size of five and a vocab of a thousand, you're going to look at 5,000 uh, possible expansions and then you whittle it back and keep five and then you do another step. So with constrained beam search, you keep a beam for every state in the finite state machine and the expansion set looks like this. So uh, the expansion set, this is for a single beam. It's basically going to be um, all the existing sequences, partial sequences that are part of any beam, not just its own beam, provided that the next word is in the vocabulary and this is the uh, state transition function from the finite state machine. So basically we'll expand any beam provided the words in the vocabulary and uh, the destination, um, once that new sequence goes through the state machine, will put you into the state corresponding to this beam. Let me show you with an example, make this clear. So this is the same example that we started with, with the uh, simple state machine. Here we've got one beam of beam search corresponding to each state. The beam size is two, so we have two sequences in each one. And we're partway through decoding. So we've already got, uh, you know, four, four words and we're now finding the next one. So uh, take beam zero. This has satisfied none of the constraints because it's the initial um, starting point. Depending on the next word, the blue boxes encode uh, where the state transition function will send that uh, resulting sequence. So here, for example, <coughs> if we now mention chair, it's uh, equivalent to that state transition here and we'll end up in beam one. So what beam one will do is look at all of the extensions that are in blue boxes because they're extensions that will end up in this beam and then it will basically consider that set and keep the best two. So in the next step, 
whatever we find in beam one will be the highest probability uh, two sequences out of this extended with that or that, this extended with that or that, or itself extended with anything that's not in C2. And so the, the crucial idea is that there's no competition until the uh, transition has been made. Um, and so that is how we basically um, guarantee that after two steps, we'll always have something in beam three corresponding to the uh, accepting state. And um, we're guaranteed that everything in here satisfies the constraints because it only arrived there by basically passing through the finite state machine. I probably haven't made that clear, but uh, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. The finite state machine is built from like the caches, I guess, or like the rules? So it has to be built from your sort of prior knowledge of what the constraint should be. So in, in the experiments, uh, we basically, we do a few different things, but one of them is we um, train a, a tag prediction model, and then we take the highest confidence tags. We take the lemma, uh, like the base word form, and then consider all the other possible extensions, and then we build a finite state machine from that kind of, um, uh, you know, all those like alternative sets. So similar to this example, uh, you basically have kind of and or conditions that you have to mention chair or chairs, you have to mention desk or table or tables, etc. So it, it's sort of similar to this, but so you, you could basically generate this state machine from image tags that were predicted, for example. Sorry. Right. Uh, so I was just trying to um, uh, visualize this, and I was just thinking maybe I should take this as an extension of that work and tell us what they were. Are you familiar with their work? So, uh, I don't know if I'm familiar with that yeah, one. So, so what they were doing is like they have beams, and, and at any given time, yeah. uh, a work can fall off the beam, but still they keep a track of the ones that fall off the track right. uh, of the beam. And then when you're at T plus two, for instance, you compare, uh, you know, you find all the probabilities of the beam uh, up until t plus one yeah. or two, uh, uh, looking at the ones that have fallen down, fall off the beam as well. Yeah. So in that sense, they do consider things that they may have never uh, looked at if they have uh, didn't look at all the ones that are falling off. Here you have an extended because you have a finite state machine yeah. where you have like um, sequence of extensions where you probably a richer version of what they have heard they were doing before. What was the, the sort of aim of their approach? Was it to like get more diversity or was uh, it? Um, it was an empty task. So okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll check it out. Yeah, sure so there, there, is, there is some like related work, um, particularly there was an M EM EMNLP paper that did poetry generation that had some similar ideas. So there, there is some related work. Um, but I don't think we've cited that one, so I'll, I'll check it out. Uh, we can, I think we're having lunch, so I'll, <laughs> I'll ask you about it then. Um, any other comments or questions? Yeah. So where, where are you getting the tags for these entries? Are these something that's provided as some tags or uh, Why don't I go on and sort of show the experiment stuff? Um, so um, here, so this is an e a bunch of examples. And in this case, uh, we're running a captioning model on uh, ImageNet. Which is, which is actually really, really hard because ImageNet is full of all of these crazy sea creatures and dog varieties and the captioning model knows nothing about it. But in this case, the, um, the um, constraints are coming from the actual ground truth label, so, um, which is a, a WordNet uh, sin set. So it includes, for example, Colobus or Colobus monkey and you can mention either of those in the constraint. And Actually, the underlying words here are words that are not even in the model's vocabulary. So we do have um, a couple of tricks to kind of making that work, but it basically comes down to using um, embedding vectors from GloVe that are pre-trained on a very large corpus. And that, that is why also it um, can lead to some failures. So, uh, you know, the, on the sort of left-hand side are some really nice examples. Um, you know, close-up shot of an orange, once you encode some knowledge about a billiard table, then we get an orange ball on a billiard table. The, the far left upper one is a really good example. Uh, 
uh, so the, the output. Oh, yeah, so the, the base is, sorry, the. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, and, and obviously this has the extra information, right? But the point is we, we know how to use that. Um, so these two are the, a couple of interesting failure cases. So here the model has now decided that the unfortunate lady's a colobus monkey. Uh, <laughs> th this one is quite interesting. So the baseline is a bird standing on top of a grass-covered field, um, mainly because Coco doesn't know anything about insects. The um, synset is for a cricket, which is obviously an overloaded term. So here, because we're using glove embedding vectors, we get as an output a bird standing on top of a cricket field. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, obviously there's no sort of word sense disambiguation in the glove vector. Um, although I think people are working on that stuff. So, uh, But that's, you know, that's kind of interesting to see, uh, I guess, what the failure modes are. Uh, in, in terms of a more uh, sort of um, quantitative evaluation, so we've repeated this evaluation from the prior work, which uh, basically what they do is they take the COCO data set, they pull out all mentions of a bunch of objects, uh, eight, eight objects which are held out, and uh, for those objects you don't get any caption training data, but you do get uh, the, the words as a bag of words. So you can basically train um, tagging models, but you don't have any of that uh, language data. And uh, so the first two are CBPR papers, um, and then this is sort of our approach with, with different numbers of included tags. Um, so, uh, and to make this sort of completely comparable, we actually use the predictions from their model as the tags, uh, and we use the same sort of underlying architecture with VGG as the CNN, etc. So it's very much like for like. And the high level, I guess, is that um, compared to sort of a baseline mo model, uh, the joint training approach really hurts your performance on the in-domain data. Uh, you, they're actually sort of losing quite a bit. Um, and strangely enough, just incorporating this constraint at test time actually does a lot better on the in-domain data, uh, which is you know, the parts where you saw the captions and the out-of-domain data, which is the parts where you never had captions. Um, and, you know, that's across basically all of the uh, different metrics, et cetera. So this is kind of an intriguing question, I suppose. Uh, you know, why are these, these sort of models that are trying to use this data at training time doing worse than, a, you know, just a constraint-based approach that just uses that data at test time with no joint training? So normally we always assume joint training has to be better. Um, so that sort of motivates some future work here for, for us. Um, one thing that would be interesting to do here is to, to actually now do a training-based approach based on this constraint. So we could do a sort of generalized uh, expectation maximization approach. So you might have a forward pass where you generate a full caption based on the constraint and then you use that uh, full caption for training the model and then you sort of iterate to then get this knowledge back into the model. So we're sort of interested to see how well that would work. And then uh, actually we've done a little bit of early work using um, Bing as a, as a very large set of um, images with tags that we can then use to try to extend out the knowledge of these captioning models you know, from that sort of data rather than from full captions. So yeah, I think that's the general direction I'm you know, very interested in because captions are just too expensive to collect. And you know we shouldn't need the full sentence for for everything. So uh, great. Let's just see how I'm going for time. So I've got to one section left. Um, yeah, I think we're going okay. So so th this is now a bit of a uh, a change from the previous work. In that I am so now moving to consider embodied tasks where the agent can actually um, move the camera around. And uh, I, you know, I wanted to put this up because I think people would have been using a slide like this ever since the 1960s about how we want to be able to talk to robots and have them do useful tasks. And uh, you know, this, this is still seeming like a long way off. And this is my like, slightly tongue-in-cheek approach or, or view on you know, perhaps why we, we sort of haven't made quite as much progress as we might. And, it seems like the different communities are a little bit siloed in, in terms of the work that goes on in the sort of vision language robotic space. So 
Uh, you know, in NLP, like, you know, it's, it's nat natural but also convenient to just abstract away vision, right? And in computer vision, you know, for a very long time, we've not dealt with um, moving the camera in a, in a controlled way. You know, we've done very little sort of active vision and mostly worked on static data sets. And then in the robotics community, um, I think many people are, you know, tackling the whole problem, but it can be really hard to build on top of someone else's work and to um, do, you know, really fair comparisons of algorithms and things. So it's easy enough to, you know, call out a problem, but um, to try to make progress, what we wanted to do was, was to have three things that are sort of special. So we wanted to have repeatable evaluation so we can do all our computer vision stuff where we love to benchmark. Uh, we want to have embodied agents uh, so that we can um, really attack the robotics problem where the robot controls the camera. And um, thirdly, we, we wanted to use real images. So there's a, there's a bunch of sort of concurrent work at the moment using synthetic data sets. Um, but I think there's, there's lots of good reasons and, and obvious reasons why we'd like to use real images if we can. And one of them is that, um, you know, the world's an open set. If I, if I kind of look at the carpet here and let's say that camera, I could go to many other buildings in Seattle and I'll be unlikely to find exactly this carpet and exactly that camera. What I will find is a whole bunch of new objects and the language used to describe them will also be different. And that's, that's sort of very different to synthetic data sets where, uh, you know, the test environments are the same objects just rendered in different locations. So um, we'd like to sort of tackle you know, there's an aspect of kind of zero shot or, or few shot learning that's um, inherent in the real world. Okay. So the idea here was to um, basically try to find the right sort of data. So uh, back in August, I went to this uh, company called uh, Matterport, which is not a super big company, but they actually have the kind of largest set of um, uh, synthetic or digitized environments that you can move around in. And uh, it's based on the uh, camera called a Matterport camera. And this is all crowdsourced data. So uh, basically people who want to um, create a walkthrough environment of a home for say sale on real estate or um, you know, a hotel or an exciting public museum, basically go and produce these digitized 3D spaces. And so our focus here is um, to use this data for vision and language navigation, which seems like a good starting point for this sort of problem. And so basically, the data that um, we got access to, which, which is now um, publicly released a couple of months ago, um, it turned out there was another group also accessing it, and, and so it's all been released. Uh, but there's 90 environments which uh, have this sort of information. So. Each, each environment is, is an entire building with, on average, about 23 rooms. The data is um, RGB images with depth. Okay, so it's, this is actually the largest sort of RGBD uh, computer vision data set now. But it, um, it comes with a bunch of other goodies. So there's textured meshes like up in the top left. Um, there's also a whole bunch of um, annotation was done by uh, the Princeton group. So you can get semantic uh, segmentations out of it. But the, the really cool part for us is that um, all these images are, are basically panoramic images. So they're all taken from a single location with a camera that sort of zooms around and captures the entire sphere. And um, all of those locations are on average only a couple of meters apart. So uh, here it gives some idea in terms of the green dots. But it, it basically gives you an environment now where you can build a simulator. And so that's what we've done. Um, the observations are the RGB image and uh, soon we'll add the depth and segmentation. The, the action space for an agent is continuous control of the camera from a single location. So you can kind of um, pan around and um, tilt up and down. And then there's discrete motion in terms of 3D movement. So here this sort of indicates uh, looking in this direction, here are the places that you can now move to next. Uh, and so the action space is therefore sort of state dependent in that depending on where you're looking, you get back a set of places you can move to in robot relative coordinates. So the natural question of course is like, is this really 
navigational freedom. Um, so this sort of gives some idea of like what the navigation uh, looks like in a, in a you know, partial example of a building. So uh, we basically built this navigation graph with a combination of ray tracing in the mesh and um, human-based checking and annotation. And the, the average graph degree is uh, a bit over four. So what that means is the, the navigation possibilities are similar to the sort of grid world assumption that's often used for these high-level tasks. It's actually, there's a bit more navigation because with a, with a grid world, you know, there'll be many directions you can't go, so um, you'll actually have less possibilities than you have here. So this is a real building, electrical building? And so these are, are real buildings. So that's what makes it so really exciting is it's just full of all this completely random stuff that you'd never find, you know, 3D model for. Um, and, it, and it's all different, so. So for the same building, in how many, how many uh, instances like this? Um, so instances of images or? Yeah, uh, no, instances of the task. But you know, multiple people may go through navigate the same building. Yeah, um, so um, in terms of the, so the number of like panoramic images I think is about 120 per building on average. Um, so in terms of the data that we collect then on top of the simulator, uh, so that's, yeah, well, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, so this just gives you a quick idea of some of the visual diversity. Um, a lot of it is living spaces, there's also offices, um, some churches, uh, it's quite a few different things. Um, I've talked about it being open world. So yeah, in getting to uh, what we're doing with it in terms of a navigation task. So the vision and language navigation task is, is something like this. Um, you've got some natural language instruction that tells you how to reach another part of the building and you need to uh, interpret this and move through the environment to reach a goal location. Uh, to generate this, we, um, we sampled about just over 7,000 paths, which are um, sort of connecting a, a room to another nearby room. We used Mechanical Turk and a, a WebGL interface to collect uh, a natural annotation. Um, so uh, yeah, and that was a you know, fairly significant effort. I think uh, it was about 1,600 hours uh, of Mechanical Turk annotation time. Um, th this just gives you an idea of uh, what the interface looks like. So this is WebGL, so you can kind of pan around in here and then you can move. Uh, so this is showing here's a trajectory that you need to describe. Um, you can click a button and you'll kind of get a fly through of that trajectory, but you can also stop at these points and look around because you, you, you don't just need a video, you sort of need that context of other things that were nearby. For example, how many exits were there from the room and things like that. Um, so that's the, the data. Uh, so on average, the instructions are about 29 words. So it's, it's, I think, genuinely a, a difficult linguistic problem. The vocab is fairly constrained, though, because a lot of it is uh, about this sort of, you know, fairly focused task. So it's constrained in terms of the command language, but relatively open in terms of the visual vocabulary that describes the things that are the kind of waypoints along the way. And the average trajectory is about 10 meters. So um, one of the ways we sort of talked about this is comparing it to visual question answering because there's quite a big community involved in, in that task already. And we wanted to show that we can start to use these vision and language technologies to do other tasks that um, might not seem, you know, so closely related, but actually can also be um, looked at as a sort of sequence-to-sequence -sequence transcoding uh, type of task. So in the vision and language navigation, you have some long string, you know, move inside the building and walk past the kitchen until you can stop at the formal dining table. And what you need to do is uh, you get sort of changing images and at each point you then uh, output a distribution over actions and um, not shown here, but the actions in our model we also uh, provide as an input, the, the previous action to help maintain context. So compared to the vision, uh, visual question answering task, it's much longer sequences. Um, obviously there's the camera manipulation with this sort of multiple images, but there's also much more structure about real buildings. So in the you know, visual question answering task, collect a data set, randomize it, and chop it into train and test. 
Whereas with this, the training environments and the test environments are, are sort of different places. So there's this naturally um, occurring um, domain adaptation problem. So we trained some baseline models and we're still fairly early days in, in getting models to work well on this data set. But there's some learning free approaches uh, such as you know, random, shortest path. Uh, we tested it on humans. Our sort of baseline learned model is a sequence to sequence model uh, with attention over the input language. And we trained it with a couple of supervised methods. Um, so teacher forcing is where it uh, is trained along the shortest path trajectory. This uh, student forcing, um, this has also been called dagger in the RL community. Basically here you sample from the model. So the model is exploring the space. But at each time, your training target is the next uh, action on the shortest path from wherever you happen to be. So it's different to, you know, in generating uh, language models, um, it's very hard to sort of feed the model back its own outputs because you move away from your training language and you don't know what the target should be. In, in these types of models, you can do that because you can always recalculate a new shortest path. Uh, so this just gives uh, an example of what it actually looks like for an agent with some um, instructions like this moving around. Uh, so this sort of gives some idea of the action they're taking and at the top is the distance from the goal. And so you, you probably missed it at the start but they sort of overshot and then came back. Um, there's some other example here. It's sort of just interesting, these visual environments with mirrors and reflections is, is so very different to synthetic data and, and you know, complicated. Uh, <coughs> and, you know, just the different things that people have in their homes. So one of the comments that I always got from the Mechanical Turk is involved was just how much they enjoyed being a, you know, looking around these buildings. So <laughs> is there any privacy issue? For example, is, uh, uh, this building or this living room uh, actually from somebody's living room? Or? Yeah, uh, this is someone's house. Yeah. Um, so all, all the people have signed waivers and agreed to academic usage. That was all done by, uh, by Matterport. So. Um, all right, just some, some kind of quick results. So humans can do about 86% uh, success. Here we define success as getting within three meters of the goal. Um, it's not 100 because it's, it's still kind of challenging for people because we've, we've taken away gestures and we've taken away dialogue, which are um, two of the things that you know, we would use to help explain some complicated instruction. Um, in terms of working in the training environments, even with our relatively um, you know, not very good model at this stage, we at least uh, you know, demonstrate this is something you can learn. But uh, generalizing to unseen environments is still really difficult. And um, so part of it is that this model is you know, just under development and there's, there's a lot of sort of obvious things we haven't done yet. But there's also a bigger picture problem here that um, moving to a new environment, you've got um, you know, new objects, new language and, and things. So um, yeah, there's sort of uh, a bunch of different ideas we have for uh, trying to move past those problems. One of the conclusions I'd like to make from this work is that, so, so this release is just 90 out of uh, like more than 700,000 buildings. And anyone can buy one of these cameras and you could go and you know, digitize this, this entire building probably in, I don't know, it would probably take a day or two. But um, it seems like using this real data is a, you know, is a great opportunity, particularly for vision and language problems because we have to go and collect the language annotations anyway. It's not like a synthetic data set. If you're working on image segmentation, maybe you can get the ground truth segmentations for free. But if you want natural language, you, you can't get it for free. So why not use real data as the foundation? Uh, so we've got, um, in terms of future work, we'd like to uh, relax the assumption of discrete navigation. And you know, with GANs and adversarial training, I think there's things we can do to generate those intermediate images. Um, there's additional data sets. So uh, this was actually funded by a, a grant from Facebook and, and there's a bunch of money still to go. So you know, we need to, we'll go and do more in terms of data collection. Uh, so yeah, there's this really interesting challenge of making it work in new environments and, and just you know, look at some of the diversity of stuff that's in the Matterport data set. I mean, to train in, in these environments and move to 
the abandoned building on the left. I mean, these are very challenging problems. Uh, then there's the issue of transferring this to a real robot and um, from my perspective that's a leap that I'd sort of like to make to, to try to um, you know, do the original goal of trying to integrate some of these communities a little bit. If we can transfer this to a robot and make it work, I think we've then got a chance of seeing uh, interest from the robotics community. And, and also, you know, we do all this sort of vision and language work and the more places we can find to apply it, I think is... Uh, Better. Yeah. Use mathematics to uh, direct the robot to manage it. Yeah. How, at which level of detail you have to provide? For the language or for the. Language. For example, we'll say you ask a machine to navigate from here to the living room, you have to go past uh, say the kitchen and, right. and the stairs. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, th that's a good, good question. So, you could sort of say, um, you know, very ambiguous instructions like. Uh, go to the kitchen, you know, bring me a spoon, uh, find my laptop and not provide like the direct path to get there. So in this work we've, we've tried to provide like a very direct path that includes all the steps. Um, but yeah, I think that's also a very interesting problem to sort of learn the common sense that we all have about building layouts and where to find things. Um, so one of the, yeah, I mean even with, with objects and things, um, so we're, we're planning to extend this to sort of navigating to find objects and also possibly navigating to find objects that are inside containers. So if you said, bring me a spoon, uh, any child could, could do that in a new, new house, but they have to know that um, spoons are in the kitchen and they're likely to be in a drawer. And so we can do something like that here because we have annotations for uh, cupboards and containers. And so we can sort of then, um, you know, basically pretend that the object is in one of those and, and the agent has to select the right container to find the object. So, yeah, we can start to maybe get to some of those common sense issues as well. Well, I'm, I'm very much done. Yeah, sure. Uh, what do you think about artificial networks? Yeah. Um, so, capsule networks, I must admit, I'm, I'm still trying to find time to get into that in detail. So, I'm not sure about capsule networks. Um, I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to look at that more. Um, certainly, using the point cloud or the depth data is uh, another direction um, that's probably similar. So, there's this recent work on PointNet and PointNet++ where you get, you know, very good features out of point clouds. So, um, that's a, that's a, something we had thought about in the direction, but yeah, the capsule stuff I'm still getting to grips with, so I'm uh, yeah, interested in anyone else's comments. Yeah. Can you um, measure your performance based on uh, the, the goal, if, if, if yeah. the agent can choose the proposed uh, yeah. goal? Are you, have you looked at um, other types of measures where, like for instance, if, if generative instructions are you know, temporally correct, Yeah. Um, or like you're doing blue or twice matches so that you know you're regenerating something that humans would like. Yeah, um, so at this stage we, we've just been working on the instruction okay. following. Um, so we do want to do the instruction generation. Uh, and um, there's possibly ways of combining the two to make better models as well, right? So um, that's, yeah. Um, in, in terms of the, one thing I didn't say about the evaluation is the robot has to, choose to end the, the navigation. And that's actually seems obvious, but it's, it's quite different to some existing work in RL for you know, following maze solving and stuff where basically if the robot blunders into the right spot without realizing it, it's considered a success. Um, so we, we don't do that here because it, it doesn't seem useful enough for a practical application. So. Would, you, would you generalize, like if you're generating instructions for yeah. following a different path? Okay. Great. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we're very happy if other people are, you know, going to actually find this interesting, uh, certainly. So um, I would just like to acknowledge so many other um, co-authors in terms of ad advisors I've had and also um, Jia Dong and Lei uh, who have also been involved in much of this work. Uh, and, yeah, that was, that was it. So uh, if there's any 
additional questions, I'd be very happy to talk about them. How close are you to real time processing, say, and some of the different things you were talking about? Uh, so let's take the, the vision and language navigation um, would be close to real time, but it, it's sort of, at the moment, um, from the environment, there's, a, there's sort of a two meter gap between making a new decision. And the, most of the time it takes to process that is the CNN, um, which yeah, takes probably in the order of know, 100 milliseconds or something. So um, I think it it's, yeah. Were they building the map dynamically, or were they, they had a map for certain effect So it, it has no map. Um, so yeah. it, it's only, it's yeah, it's only uh, memory is, is basically in the LSDM. So it's sequentially processing these images and um, it's like memory of the, because it's obviously a partially observed environment, it's kind of memory of its trajectory is encoded in the LSTM. Uh, I mean, uh, like you asked, I want to go to the bathroom in some other room. Yeah. If it had not experienced that room, it would not know how to find it, but if it did. So the, um, actually, I, I should have a slide with, with more examples. Uh, I, I don't have that. Um, but just taking this one. so. What we try to do, um, similarly to um, Jad Ong's question, is to make sure it's like very specific um, so that it's not ambiguous about sort of which way to go next. And the model has uh, encodes this with a, an RNN and LSTM, but then it has an attention module that at, as it processes uh, in the environment can sort of focus on the relevant part of the instruction. Yeah, um, although that's, uh, we're still getting that to sort of work well, so it's, it's not quite um, tuned yet. We, we may need to actually, um, in training, introduce some of the image segmentation as well to help make that link between the language and the grounded concepts in the image. Yeah. Just to follow up the question, what kind of results do you expect to increase that information? For example, for a navigation app, yeah. maybe you probably map information probably the Yeah, um, so there's, there's sort of this related task, I guess, where you say, well, instead of having a one-shot evaluation, the robot actually lives in this building for a while and it can map and, and you know, build whatever structure it wants. Um, so it's sort of a different task. Um, I'm, just, I'm just asking what kind of a precision result you would get. If you just think of all the map information, you have a full map information. Yeah, but I don't think there's an answer to that directly because the map... We don't have the sort of map in information that grounds the language. Um, so we have to learn that association between the language and, and some representation of the environment and the action space. So that could be either a map or it could be the sequence of images. Yeah, and also think of in a living room when there's a robot serving the human and serving the family. Uh, human never use a map to reference a particular point. Human will actually go to the kitchen to get that and so they need to need to map the natural language to the kitchen and phone to the location of the map. That's almost us. I mean, almost the same problem here. So, yeah, it would be interesting to sort of set up that task, though, where let's say that the robot gets, um, you know, a chance to map the environment first, and then it has to work. Um, yeah, there's lots of directions. Yeah. Uh, do you end up learning the forward Um, so it, it's a little bit in between. <laughs> so there's not a um, like we ha we sort of like one one thing you could do is uh, you know you've got some mesh for the environment and you can actually give the robot a certain size and shape and then you can do um, you know um, obstacle detection and and sort of <laughs> see where the robot can move in its configuration. So we haven't gone to that level of detail. We've, we've basically um, ray traced between you know, these points and said, well, are you hitting a, a large obstacle or not? And then we've kind of checked it with human eyeballs to see if it's reasonable. So, so there's sort of situations where, say, the robot might be here, the next node is over there, but even though there's a desk in the middle, it's still a pretty simple planning problem to just kind of go around the edge of it. So those types of things are allowed. 
Um, and also up and down stairs is allowed. So here, for example, these graphs connect up and down stairs. But you know, how much useful information about collisions does it learn from that? Um, it's probably not the ideal environment for learning that, to be honest. So, yeah. Um, no, uh, it, it's only what it observes from its position. So, and, and it only observes like the first uh, edge in the graph, not not the rest of it. So, uh, so we kind of imagine that you know you could have a um, a low level planning algorithm running on the robot that can sort of give you a set of candidates based on where you are. You could sort of go here or here or here, and that's the sort of input that it operates on. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. So. Thank you. Thank you.